I'm saying this out loud, and I'm also going, this is very Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> this is the most Catholic podcast I've ever been on. <laughs> Podcasts, the 21st century radio show. Two friends were hit by a quarantine and found themselves bored in 2020. But they committed the one taboo among content creators. Never start a podcast because you're bored. Will they go mad? Give up? Or finish watching each other's favourite shows? Whatever happens, listen with care. For what could equal the horror of spoilers. Welcome to the Sudden Violence Podcast. I'm Ginger. And I'm Kara. And in this show, we will be discussing and doing somewhat daily recaps of the series Life on Mars and the anime Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. And tonight's episode has a wonderful theme. The best theme. <laughs> the, the most exciting theme. Drugs. Drugs. <laughs> Drugs. <laughs> it's, it's nice how that works out. Yeah. I have a question in my mind that I'm going to wait until after you do the synopsis, so I'm going to hang on to this sure. question. Sure. So, as usual, we start with the violence, and then we'll move on to the sin, and that means we start with Life on Mars. Yeah. Tonight, Season 2, Episode 5, a.k.a. The Drugs Episode. <laughs> uh, okay, so the episode is not entirely about, there's a lot of drugs and a lot of, you get me. The cold open for this episode, I'll say, is probably the most famous, the most liked. It is the uh, the Camberwick Green opening. If you are British, you 100% know what that is. If you are American, just imagine Sam Tyler popped up in the neighborhood of Make Believe on Mr. Rogers. Can I say, basically. I have a note written down here that yeah. says, that's a crazy good sculpt. I want that intro ingrained on my eyeballs. <laughs> It was very good. It was really good. <laughs> when season two came out, that intro was like how season two was advertised. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, it was It was actually a really big deal. Mm. But yeah. So yeah, Sam basically had this weird children's show puppet dream where he came out of a magical music box and a little puppet Gene beat a guy up with a garbage can <laughs> lid. So, <laughs> may, maybe, maybe I'll link to it. <laughs> It's just so funny. <laughs> the clip is floating free, so I'll probably link to it down in the description just so you, people can go you see You have it to. It's just so yeah. damn funny. <laughs> it's so wonderful. And a little sad Sam puppet. So anyway, that aside, Sam wakes up in his little garbage room. He's clearly sick. He gets a call from Ray and Chris, but also they're on his TV. Something is up with Sam. So he runs outside, and uh, according to the various things coming in from Hospital World, they've screwed up his meds, and he is now speeding. It is a wonderful sequence. They play with the signs and all the different things along the road. So he's messed up. He gets the CID just in time to see a man try to hang himself in the canteen. Sam attempts to beat up Gene, tell him to stay out of Camberwick Green. <laughs> the guy almost ends up getting hanged by his own efforts. He he is rescued after the cold open. This man is Simon Lamb. He has threatened to kill himself unless someone named Graham Bathurst is freed. So Lamb's wife and daughter have been kidnapped and that is the demand that was on the ransom note is free Graham Bathurst. Bathurst was convicted uh, sort of pre-Sam arriving of killing his teen girlfriend Charlie. Gene oversaw this case himself. He was very like overwrought about this case because this is a teenage girl who died and this is just everyone's blood is boiling over this so lamb knew the family he was charlie's gym teacher so as sam is going around getting info on this he's getting these like speed psychic memories because of his screwy medication basically so we are for the one and only time in the show we're seeing scenes without sam in them because we're seeing flashbacks before him so He's watching this case happen where Gene tracks the guy down. The guy tries to, like, you know, use his grandmother as a hostage. And Gene takes him in and questions him. And the kid is, like, a son of a bitch. And, you know, Gene kicks the shit out of him and then, like, starts telling him how long he'll be in jail. And so after that, 
Chris tells his bit, and we get this wonderful flashback to Chris with a terrible mustache. Oh, it's an awful, it's a it's a completely ill-advised mustache. It's this very wispy, I just grew my first mustache mustache, and it may well have been his first. <laughs> So Chris was put in charge of questioning Charlie's classmates and the girls were being very weird and flirty with him because high school girls, yo. And it turns out that Simon Lamb's daughter was the one who mentioned that Charlie had an older boyfriend, like three years older than her. And so it is question like maybe that's why the Lambs were targeted. So they investigate, they go to the Bathurst house and they find Graham's cousin from the Navy, and he goes tearing when the police show up, and so they drag him in, and it turns out the reason he ran is because he's AWOL. Not because he did anything, he just is not on the ship where he's supposed to be. Gene is still not quite sure, he is convinced that this is within the family, and he made the right choice, and he will not be swayed from this. So they get Simon Lamb in, Annie talks him through doing a radio appeal to try to figure out who sent the ransom note. And then he very awkwardly tries to confess. And I want to come back to that. I just want to put a pin in that for the end of the episode. Then Sam goes to Annie and Annie steps forward and she's like, hey, but you know, you didn't, maybe this, you didn't really do a good job of this. You were really sort of emotionally invested in this. And I think you were just pushing for a result and it was badly handled. Jean and Ray are both pissed off by this. Sam is on her side. We see the little psychic memory of Annie's version of it, where, you know, yeah, things are going largely as was said, but Bathurst is more, like, nervous and sort of bullied into a corner, and so his awkwardness comes off as callousness the way it did in Jean's memory. But Ray and Jean are sticking by their charge. They're saying, no, we are absolutely right. Our big piece of evidence was the rag that was stuffed in Charlie's mouth and it had oil on it. And Graham Bathurst worked on motorbikes. So that's, that's their big thing. That's number one. Sam gets a phone call from the doctors in the hospital saying, hey, we're going to try to fix your meds. You're probably going to go into a deeper coma. And then I have in my notes, Sam go big coma. (laughs) Accurate. It's kind of like that scene we saw when he was in the hospital in season one, where you just get the lights kind of shutting down and shutting down and everything just, the darkness just kind of closes in on him while he's standing in the office and everything goes dark. He wakes up in, it's kind of like the locker room, but there's no doors or anything. And it's like, he's got a couch and he's got a TV and now Sam is going to play Night Trap. Yes. Uh, that is, that is I, no exaggeration, listeners. That is the, 100% the most accurate representation of what's going on. Sam is sitting in front of this little TV. He has buttons. He can choose which channel to go to. And, like, psychically, or maybe because he's been doing a good job of teaching the squad, he has some minor effect over what they choose to do. <laughs> so he is genuinely playing Night Trap with 100% less vampires. Uh, so Gene takes the boys out to investigate Lamb's house just in case there was some like previous ransom note he missed Chris maybe under Sam's guidance maybe not Sam is like whispering stuff to him like be careful you know look where you're going Chris finds a family photo of the Lambs but the daughter is like visibly missing from it like the wife's hand is sticking out Like she's got her hand on someone's shoulder and someone has retouched the daughter out of the photo. They bring this in and they also note that the ransom notes use the font from the local newspaper. Meanwhile, Annie has found in her massive stack of files complaint letters of police negligence from around the time of the case. They were signed by Charlie's mom. Incidentally, Phyllis comes by and is like, hey, yeah, I found out why Sam is passed out in the locker room. He drank so despite with LSD when he went to a club. Ha ha ha. So there are apparently two reasons for his being passed out. There's a there's a real reason and an in-universe reason. <laughs> Basically. So Annie goes to Charlie's parents' house and she asks her mother about the letter. And the mother's like, well, I signed them. My husband wrote them felt it would be more effective if they came from the grieving mother. The father considers the kidnappings to be natural justice. So this, combined with when they find out what the father does for a living, which is he makes the spot the ball puzzles for the local newspaper. And spot the ball is they would take an action photo from a sports game and they would retouch out 
the ball. And the puzzle was, can you see where in the photo the, the soccer ball was? Oh, so, okay. Yeah, so that's a spot the ball thing. And so that was his job, as he made those puzzles for the newspaper that also happened to share a font with the ransom note. So now we have a man who thinks that the kidnappings were actually okay, who works for a newspaper that had the font, and who has the specific then rare skill set needed to leave that threat. Mm -hmm. So basically it's him. So Annie goes to his shed. Sure enough, the wife and daughter are down there in the basement of the shed. In comes Charlie's dad to attack Annie. But fortunately, the boys arrive, as in Jean, Ray, and Chris, and others arrive in time to arrest the father. Sam wakes up in the locker room, and Annie is sitting by him, and it's really cute. And he's like, I feel great now. And he's like, let's go on a date. And they hug. And it's adorable. And the date, incidentally, is he asks her to go to a specific place that during his night trap scene, he saw her looking at a newspaper sort of wistfully at this ad. So asks her to go specifically where she wants to go. Outside, Sam and Jean are sort of wrapping everything up as Simon Lamb and his family are leaving. And they're talking about the oil on the rag and how it's motor oil. And Sam's like, actually, no. That's tongue oil, uh, T-U-N-G. It's a Chinese tree. And he says, no, that you use that on wood, like gym equipment. And as you'll recall, Simon Lamb was Charlie's gym teacher. So as he's leaving, you see him turn around and there's this horrible skeevy shot of him like eyeing this little girl going by on a bicycle. And Sam and Jean are like, oh shit hang on, and it, it ends with the two of them like, sir, can we can we talk to you for a yeah, second? Yeah, wait, hang on, <laughs> hang on. And it, and it closes out on that with them basically going, okay, we solved that, and oh shit, we did get the wrong guy. Yeah. <laughs> so, justice has been done twice. Yeah. So, yeah, that's the episode. Which, that ending really throws that quote-unquote fake admission into a whole lot, because when you rewatch it, you're like, wow, this is a really doubly poorly acted fake well, isn't confession. Well, is not that like a, um, like, a, 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 when, you're, when you're genuinely talking about like an actual psychopath, can't, they, they're, they're the kind of people that could, like, pull that off, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the actual psychopath it could actually be the person who does commit the murder, but then confesses and it seems like it's an act yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, so... What's funny is when I was watching the episode the first time, when I had no idea what was going on, I was taken out of the moment slightly because the guy who played Lamb is... I haven't seen him anywhere, but I consider him a good actor. But when he did the fake confession, I was like, this scene is really poorly acted. Like, it was bugging me. Because he's like, yeah, I did it. Yeah, that's it. And, and, and it looked like someone doing a high school play. And I was like, that really bothers the hell out of me because everything else he did was good. And then I saw the ending and I was like, oh. Yeah. Oh, that was on. It was supposed to be badly acted. Okay. Yeah. I get ya. That was clue number seventeen. That it was him. <laughs> his his bad confession really was a bad. Mm. <laughs> you know, I really like this episode because you you already told me beforehand that Sam is in every scene of the show, and I, I mm -hmm. think I realized that about what think, 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 four episodes in, you told me that, and I was like, oh yeah, I guess I didn't notice yeah. that. And I don't know if I would have noticed it unless you had told me. I guess. Um, yeah. but it was, what was interesting to me was because Sam is not in every scene, we actually, I feel like we're, we're finally getting some more just, like, genuine character interactions or, like, character portrayals because they're not around Sam. Like, it was very interesting to see Jean, because the way these flashback things work is, um... It's it's interesting, and I felt like they, they were, when they were writing this episode, they were probably like, how can we get around not having Sam in every scene? Oh, I know, we'll do this. And it reminded me, you know what it made me think of was the video game Psychonauts, where oh, it, you oh, go yeah. into a person's head, and you're seeing their mind and their struggles from their perspective. Oh, shoot. Yeah. Um, and in, here's my theory. This is Ginger's theory corner. Psychonauts did come out before this show was created. <laughs> it, I'm just saying, maybe some of the writers played Psychonauts. I don't know. Um, but irregardless of that, is Sam is having these sort of like weird 
psychic flashbacks when he's in the presence of the other person talking about them. So he sees him first with Gene, he sees him with Annie, and I'm pretty sure he sees it with Ray and Chris. Uh, like all of them, sees, right? Yeah, he does see it with he sees it with Chris because he's they're talking about questioning the girls. He sees it with Ray because Ray is like, "Oh, you were sleeping at home and I was working like for 36 hours." And then you flash to Ray just sleeping in his chair. <laughs> But, well, the reason I bring that up, I think it's interesting, is because Gene's perspective, like, I would say the two prominent ones are Gene and Annie. Like, those are the two prominent flashbacks you get. And with Gene, he's very emotionally, like, driven to his core to find the killer of this girl. Mm -hmm. And he's very serious, and he's very just... He does his job, and it's very grounded and very serious. Which we see Gene being that way sometimes, but I felt like this was like the first time you're genuinely seeing Gene in this role. When you're like, oh, I see why he's now in his position at work. I see how he has the respect of people under him. Yeah. Because he's not just being like, you know, a blokey, hard ass. He actually does do his job very seriously when obviously the occasion calls for it. And then yeah. what I thought was interesting was... You didn't get a whole lot of Gene's perspective of other people in that clip, but when Annie was the one that was having the psychic flashback through Sam, I thought that Annie's perceptions were tinging the characters more. And obviously, mm-hmm. obviously this was true when you're the scene of the interrogation. Where, what's the kid's name? It was Graham, right? Yeah, Graham Bathurst. Yeah. When Graham was being interrogated, for in Gene's perspective, he was this punk-ass, snarky kid. And in Annie's perspective... Yeah, he was a nasty, absolute criminal. Yeah, in but Gene's. in Annie's perspective, he was this very confused, very scared, very frightened, you know, teenager. And the, the, the thing is, is that we never actually see Graham in the show, like in the present day of the show, right? We right. only see him we, through we flashback. So we don't, we actually really don't know what he's actually like. Yeah. But the other thing I did notice was in Annie's memory, she remembered Ray being very careless and kind of stupid and it, when he was at the crime scene. Oh, yeah, he was and just batting around with a stick. I feel, and that, it actually, it's kind of contradiction because Ray had said, like, I took this very seriously. Of course, I was also pissed off. And so I'm, I wrote down this note being like, what the, like, what is this? And I think what it is is, like, we know that Annie has not had good interactions with Ray. So it stands yeah. to reason Annie doesn't like Ray very much. <laughs> <laughs> so I would imagine in her memory, she's remembering Ray being a dopey and lazy yeah. detective. Whereas in Jean's memory, Jean doesn't see Ray that way. And so that's where I thought, oh, we're not seeing the quote unquote truth. We're seeing the individual's perspectives mm-hmm. of the situation. But we're definitely getting two, not even two different scenarios necessarily, but just two perceptions of the same thing going on. And you can find the truth of it somewhere in between. I yeah. do want to put big kudos, I mean, to anybody who is in any of those scenes because they're playing very, not hugely different versions of themselves, but uh, except for the kid who played Graham. Yeah. I'm looking up his name, Adam Beresford. I've never seen him in anything else. But God, I one thing about this episode is he is good. Yes, he's very good. In Gene's version, he is this actual like complete sleaze ball. And then in Annie's version, just his his posture, the way his hands are held, just everything. It's like that's two different characters. Mm-hmm. And I, I love it. But yeah, I agree with what you're saying is, especially, I think that really comes to light in Chris's memory. Oh, because, God. <laughs> because, because that absolute gaggle of threatening high school girls. <laughs> I, I, I really feel for him. Which, in fairness, this, is not, this reminds me of the John Mulaney riff, where John Mulaney's whole thing is, you know, 12-year-olds are the meanest, nastiest people. <gasps> yeah. They will point out your insecurities. <laughs> <laughs> but and poor, on, a, on a similar note, teenage girls are very much the same thing. <laughs> poor Chris in that in that scene where it's like one of them was like, "What have you got in your pocket?" It's like, "Oh, it's my juicy fruit," and all of them start freaking out and laughing <laughs> at him. It's like, "Oh, hon, no, oh, oh, Chris." <laughs> But this, yeah, this was a very, very interesting episode. And it also, just editing-wise, was very fun to look at. Mm -hmm. When they would do the little fuzz effects and you're like, they treated the flashbacks like, even before Sam was actually literally looking at a TV, they treated them as kind of like TV channels. Yeah, they were, they had like an effect on them so that you you knew you were in kind of like a memory um, Mm -hmm. going on. 
I think it was, yeah, you, you had pointed out while we were watching that Gene is very different when he's not having to uh, deal with Sam. In fairness, <laughs> but, I would also be different if I had to deal with Sam all the time. <laughs> yeah, the only people Gene's got with him are people who are like, yes, sir, absolutely, sir, I want to be just like you, sir, mm-hmm. and... So he can just sort of do his thing. He's not got, you know, future boy from the future telling him that he has to write everything down 20 times and, <laughs> and, and, lo- and look at evidence and, you know... I'm going to once quest- again emphasize, it makes it sound like I hate Sam. I don't hate Sam. We love Sam. Sam is just really easy to make fun of. <laughs> we love Sam. <sighs> Sam is adorable. We love him. But uh, he really is very easy to make fun of. <laughs> Future boy from the future. Bless his heart, he's wonderful, and again, it is one of the greatest roles John Sim has played. <laughs> Just, he's so good. Mm-hmm. He's so good. But yes, this is the drugs episode. Drugs. And it's fun. Drugs. Alright, and... I, what, I, what I wanted to ask you, because yes. I kept saying, Sam, Ty- the Tylers love drugs. Oh no. So there's a joke in Doctor Who fandom, and that it just says, Rose loved drugs. And I have to know, did that just come from, like, a fan comic, or did that, like, come from something? Because I was only in the fandom starting in, like, 2008, so I feel like maybe I missed something. But I did have a meme on my dorm door my sophomore year, and that said, Rose loved drugs, so... Um, I am actually looking it up in the moment. (laughs) Okay, (laughs) there is... there is a comic... Uh, and it looks like it's an online comic. Oh! Is that the one oh, with Martha? It's, it's the one with Martha. Okay, so it was a comic. <laughs> for, for, tho- for those of you who aren't seeing this or who don't know, there was a fan comic of Doctor Who made where it was basically mocking the idea that the 10th Doctor was still brooding over Rose while Martha was right there. And so the first panel is like, so this is New Earth, says Martha. And the Doctor says, I was with Rose last time. <laughs> And the second panel, you've taken me to the slums? Rose lived in the slums. <laughs> Are they selling drugs? Rose loved drugs! <laughs> and then later on, they see, well, later on they see the face of Bo, and Martha's like, what is it? And the doctor runs off crying, and one of the cat nurses says, how could you be so insensitive? Rose always asked, what is it? Oh, God. <laughs> so that's, that, that was, is the origin of... That was yeah. so cathartic to me in 2008, seeing that comic, I'm just saying... <laughs> But yeah, so the whole thing about Rose Love Drugs is like a Doctor Who meme, basically. And yeah. Sam Tyler shares a name with one Rose Tyler, and so all I could think of is just being like, Sam Love Drugs! So, yeah, that is... Uh, any Anything else we have on this episode? Uh, again, I thought it was really good. I thought this episode really played with the coma thing really well, as in mm-hmm. just that whole thing of... We've, we've seen the imagery of like, the lights going up before, but I think what's really interesting is that we see that that scene of... Sam waking up in the room and he's stuck there to imply a deeper level of coma. <laughs> you know, yes. he's on level three coma right now. Um, I, I just thought that was a... Because, again, you're trying to utilize... You know, you know, what's the point in saying your character's in a coma if you're not going to really do anything with that idea? And so I just think this is actually a good episode that really played with that idea. And I think it would have been a tired thing had they done it a lot. And also, in universe, at one point I said to you, like, why is this Sam... Like, Sam should have had some heart attacks by now, because he, he's shown this, like, this stressed out anxiety thing before, in previous mm-hmm. episodes, and I'm like, Sam, you need to have a heart attack, or fake that you're having one to get anybody to take you seriously. And it seems like he finally did it this episode, where he finally decides, I should pass out, maybe then someone will take <laughs> you seriously. <laughs> um, but had this happened before, I feel like then it would have been, like, an overused thing. So I think to do this this one time was a really interesting and good use of your theme here because it was very you know just it was just very a new way to to approach the episode and it's also it also really hammers home just how hard this was hitting sam this is like this is the big shit you know previously he's he's hearing the voices stuff happens but it's being treated by and large like dude is being weird i kind of want to do like the the garfield minus garfield type thing where I would love at some point to to watch those scenes where Sam is hearing the hospital noises, but I'd love them without the hospital noises. Because mm. I, I want to see what that looks like. From everybody else's perspective? <laughs> where, where Sam is just sitting there covering and uncovering his ears and freaking out. And Gene's just like, hey, do you want to pay attention? And he's just like, uh, uh, uh. It's like... Yeah, when we have all the noise, it makes complete sense to us that he's losing his shit. Right. But 
what's going to be happening on the outside is new boy is stumbling around the station <laughs> for right. no good reason. Right, exactly. <laughs> Bless him. <laughs> Bless him. We do love him. <laughs> and and we and we do love that he finally asked Annie on a date and her finally. answer is and her answer is that she smiled and said I'll think about it. <laughs> well, it's good enough. <laughs> Uh, she's flirting. It's so, progress you know. for these two. Well, she's flirting, so it's all good. So yeah, that is our violence. That's our violence. Now onto our sin. Yes, yes, because this these episodes. These episodes. Oh, okay. So you're excited about this too. Ho 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 ho. I I am excited to talk about tummy hell. Okay. <laughs> In episode, so our episodes today were Tummy Hell. No, they were episode 25, <laughs> Doorway of Darkness, and episode 26, Reunion. In episode 25, we are in the, the stomach of gluttony. We open up, we have Ed and Ling, and they're just like, where are we? They're wandering around. They find out there is no way out. There is no exit. There are no walls. There are no ceilings. There is no, there's a floor. They actually at one point create a well from alchemy and throw a torch in there and listen for it to fall and hit the bottom. And there is no bottom. So they are in tummy hell. <laughs> to the point where they actually, they're wandering around for so long, Ling passes out because he's a weak, he's a, he's a pansy, and he passes out from hunger. And they, and Ed goes, well, I have leather boots, we can boil my boot and eat that, and because he has an auto male leg, it's not really a big deal, so they boil one of Ed's boots and eat the boot. In the stomach, they later meet up with Envy, which, did I miss this? I, did I miss Envy getting eaten up by gluttony in the previous episode? God, oh, I wait. don't know. A it lot must have, happened. It must have been because Ling and Emmy were fighting, and Ed. Okay, it must have been that, that whole attack when Gluttony ate the both of them. I think it also ate Envy, who was in the background, because objects mm. don't. The thing doesn't stop just because objects are in front of the thing. So this was like, Bleh! and ate everything in its path, like a five mile radius. Anyway. The boys meet up with Envy, and Envy is like, I'm stuck here too, so I need GAF right now. And when they're talking, Envy eventually says to them, basically, oh, and by the way, I was the person who started the Ishval War. And, and because when I was saying previously, like, you know the whole Ishval thing that we're learning more about? Remember this, there's still more to be revealed here. Well, it's revealed that, because the story about the Ishval War is that a soldier of the Amestrian army just shot and killed a little kid for no reason, and that started the whole war. Well, as it turns out, it was Envy, shapeshifted into the guise of a soldier, and so Envy was the one who started the whole shit show. And, you know, Envy also went through, you know what the best part is? He was a political moderate, and then he couldn't defend himself. Ah ha ha, I'm a shitbag. I'm the best. Every fan loves me. I don't know why. I don't know why the fans love Envy so much. Don't ask me, people. So, kind of learning that is... Not, you know, pretty awesome, especially because, you know, Envy does that whole thing of like, ah, you humans are so dumb. I'm Envy. That's my Envy voice from now on. I'm Envy. It sounds exactly like him. It sounds just like him. Um, Envy also reveals him, I think they get into a fight at some point. Well, they do. Envy reveals that he has a true form. His true form is one of two uses of CGI in this show. As I said last night, they use CGI noticeably twice in this show. One is on ceiling fans, and one is on Envy's giant green dog person form. Envy's true form is like this weird giant green dinosaur dog thing. It's what if the Absorbaloff was a dog? Yes, and it has like body <laughs> screaming coming out of it, and it's made of bodies that are all like, no, nah, I've been torture as hell, and that's his true form. The other plot happening outside of this is, number one, Mei Chang notices that her panda is no longer there. She tells Yoki that uh, the convenient reason why Xiao Mei is a small panda is that she has a disease that lets her not grow, so that she is, she is forever a Yorkie-sized panda. <laughs> And uh, May also reveals that in the country of Xing, her clan is one of like the weakest, and so she's trying very, very hard to come up to return home with something that'll give her clan a one up on everybody else. Because I think there's like fifty clans in Xing, and she's like, my family's at the bottom, and it sucks. Scar is like, hey, let's go look for your panda. So Scar and May are on a mission to find the panda. <laughs> And the other plot is Mustang is now deep in the shit show of the everything going on. And so King Bradley is talking to Mustang. And King Bradley tells Mustang 
oh, you know, yeah, a homunculus, and also the country of Amestris has been under the control of the homunculi and our people since the dawn of the country. And I believe the country is implied to be, like, 400 years old, I think. Like, four, 500 years old. It's not super old. It's, like, America old. <laughs> it is a relatively new country, and so that's the- so the whole time the country has been under the control of these forces. So yes, Hughes was really right. Like, the country is rotten from the inside out, and has been since the beginning. And at the end of the episode, or so, you know what, I don't remember. Let's just keep going with what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> you know, Mustang is like, well, what about your family? And like, what about your son? Like, how do you have a son? And King Bradley is like, oh, you think my son's my weakness? Oh, 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 oh but I know what your weakness is. And the implication is Bradley knows distinctly that it's Hawkeye in particular, but what Bradley does then is he splits up Mustang's gang. And so there's four, five, four, five, <laughs> I can't remember anymore. <laughs> Falman's, Falman's going to the north, Fury's going to the south, Raina's going to the west, Mustang is, I think, is stuck in Central still. Oh, Havoc, but Havoc's been demilitarized, that's why I was thinking there was more people. And then Hawkeye is now the personal assistant at King Bradley, so she is now <sighs> under his uh, supervision constantly. So that is that move. So we have a further setback of the further setback to Mustang and his gang. At the end of the episode, it's actually pretty funny. We have Gluttony and Al hanging out. And Gluttony, honestly, for like these 30 seconds, is actually kind of funny as a character because he's just like a dopey, innocent, <laughs> childlike persona. And so he doesn't know what to do because he's like, oh, I didn't need to, I should have eaten them. And then Alphonse is like, well, this father you mentioned, I should go see him, right? Because I'm a sacrifice, right? And Gluttony's like, that sounds like a perfect idea. <laughs> and off they go to Central, because apparently father is in Central, and Alphonse thinks this is shocking. I don't know why Alphonse thinks this is surprising. <laughs> like, your father's in Central? Yes, Alphonse. You were at the weird door thing underground. Of course all this shit's going on in Central. Come on, Al. <laughs> Whatever, he's 14. I will let this slide. And then, in the next episode, the boys in Envy are now fighting. Because of course they are. <laughs> like, why not? At one point, though, they're getting really beat up. Envy kind of kicks the crap out of Ed and swallows Ed via tongue made of more tortured human souls. <laughs> I didn't like that. I know you didn't like that. But oh, this is this is my it. whole fascination with like weird amorphous body I wouldn't say body horror, but like body mutation. <laughs> I don't know. I love body horror, I just didn't like that. I know. It's yeah, so he <laughs> he all he's doing though is he puts Ed inside his mouth. Blech. Ed inside Envy's mouth sees the Philosopher's Stone, and at a certain point he I think he sees thinking and sees something else. He kicks out Envy's tooth. And in the ruins, Ed realized something. What in Gluttony's stomach is everything Gluttony's eaten. So you see the part of the house, you see Hawkeye's car, apparently he ate, you see Mustang's fire is in there, and then you see just like, it's it's like filled with blood, since Gluttony's eaten a lot of people. Um, you see some bodies, and then you see, you see buildings, and Ed noticed some ruins. And what they ended up piecing together is that these ruins are actually the demolished parts from Xerxes that Ed saw back a few episodes when he was they were in the Xerxes ruins. And what they end up doing, with Envy's help, Envy is like, alright, I'm gonna help you now. <laughs> Cause why not? Envy <laughs> in his big green dog form brings the pieces over and they kind of assemble this and what Ed notices is, oh, he's like, this is a thing for human transmutation. Like these symbols, you know, the sun means God and I think the moon means man, or whatever. I just realized I said moon man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so what Ed's saying is something about human transmutation happened in Xerxes, and the way the symbols are positioned, he's talking about, well, this, you know, the way this lion or this dragon is positioned with the sun is implying I shall take the power of God. This is something about a big, this is a big power grab, whatever happened here, um, and maybe that maybe that's why Xerxes fell, something with, you know, with this going on. Because as we are aware, human transmutation does cause some shit. And, you know, that's kind of what Ed's hypothesis is. Back with Mustang and Bradley, Bradley reveals this whole thing where, so Bradley was raised, was a, is a human. He was raised from baby, from infancy, through his adult life with a bunch of other guys, and they were all just basically trained 
to be the next future ruler of Amestris. They were trained to be this for this country. So, you know, he talks about, you know, we, we did all the studying, we did the sword fighting, and, you know, it's all this, like, Bradley had human emotions and everything. He was once a cute little baby, and then he was, he a, was. He was a cute little baby, and then he turned into a sword wielding <laughs> adult who just kind of, like, pokes the guy in the shoulder, and he's like, ah, he bleeds, and... What this all was is that they were basically taking, I think the whole idea is they were then injecting the essence of the homunculus wrath into these guys, and if you survived the process, you became a homunculus, and then you were also going to be groomed again to be the future ruler of the country. And so he Bradley talks about how, yeah, and I was I was the twelfth test subject. He looks over and sees the corpses of the people who failed because they just died. And he says, My options were either to give in and die, or I could overcome the pain and I became the homunculus, and that's what he decided to do. And so we learn the story about Bradley is a, is a human. He has aged like a human and everything else, whereas homunculi are implied to be are immortal, but he's not. Because he's a sort of like a, few, like a hybrid homunculi human, a, a humani, homuncul, <laughs> a homunculum, a, 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 a humanculi. A humanculi. There we go. Bradley's a That's humanculi. That's terrible. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the meantime, I just want to point out that Al and Gluttony are wandering around the city, and they enter in this very easy-to-find door, and they go into the sewers, and Al is like, oh, there's dead bodies, what? And Gluttony is like, oh, there's just, we have, like, some chimera guards. And I'm like, you can just go innocent sp- sewer spelunking and end up getting killed because you're just like, oh, cool, an unlocked door. Let's go down <laughs> in the sewers, guys, for funsies. They didn't really hide this very well. So Scar and May see them, and they see Xiao Mei, and they go, and now they're so now Scar and May are following Gluttony and Alphonse. They are they are in play as well in the sewers, although uh, but they're fighting off the chimeras as this is all happening. What Ed deduces is when Gluttony opens his stomach, you see a big eyeball, and Ed's like, "That's weird." And Envy says, "Oh, Gluttony is like a failed experiment of father." Um, he was supposed to do something. So what it is is that Gluttony is a failed attempt to create a truth portal, basically. Because when you open the door of truth, you see that big eye, you know, and it has all the hands and, you know, it grabs you. So then Ed decides, well, the only way to get out of this, then, is to open up the truth portal. We have to perform human transportation, open up the truth portal, and get out. Ed decides, all right, we're going to do that. Ed does it on himself, opens up the portal. Link, go in. Envy, go in. I guess you're our friend now. Envy, go in. (laughs) And then Ed goes in last. And when Ed goes through the portal, he ends up in the white room that we always see. However, he looks behind him and he sees... And Alphonse. So what this actually, this proves Ed's theory, which is that he and Alphonse's souls are intertwined at this point. And Ed is like, come on, come with me. And Alphonse's body says, I can't come with you. I can only go with my own soul. So Ed, you know, is pulled out and he's like, I will come back. I will get you. Hang on. You're not going to die here. And Ed is pulled back through his gate. Alphonse, his body is left behind. Alphonse's body, by the way, is very, very, it's like sickly thin. It has grown because Alphonse has grown in this time span, but he has like long hair. He has, he's like rib cage thin, long fingernails. And um, yeah, the episode ends with Gluttony and Alphonse outside the door. I'm guessing they're going to go see Father next, and everyone is mm. on the way, and the boys are outside, are getting out of the portal. Where they'll end up, nobody knows. But that's where we are for next episode. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So, on, on the theme of this podcast episode, Bradley got, like, alchemy drugs. <laughs> I guess. Close enough. It counts. Yeah, clo- close enough for the episode. Seeing Bradley's backstory mm-hmm. was very interesting. Yeah. I find it very interesting that with so many of these characters, no matter what they did, we start out, so I was a chubby baby, and (laughs) (laughs) Um, I was a chubby baby, and then the sin happened. (laughs) (laughs) I've expected to see many things. Seeing Bradley as a chubby baby is not a thing I expected. Fair point. Fair point. He was an adorable little kid, and I wish things had gone better for him. This is true. 
I, I say that about most of the kids. In fact, all of the kids in this show, actually. I'm sorry, this is cracking up for you. <laughs> Everyone starts off with a chubby baby, and then the sin happens. And then the, and then the sin happens. This is very... But... This is, I'm saying this out loud, and I'm also going, this is very Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> this is the most Catholic podcast I've ever been on. <laughs> And it's and it's about TV shows. Yeah. Well, hey, whatever. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no. I'm very interested to see how like how forthcoming he was with this. He's like, yeah, no. Here's what happened, my dude. Yeah, and I think like I actually mentioned to you in the previous one where they're at, they're you know, it's it's King Bradley and his wife and and his son Salim and they're eating dinner. And I was saying to you, I'm like, I find this so interesting. And I, mm-hmm. I think it's just because I think it's really easy to make a monster. It's really easy to make an evil character. But you're also going, you're just like, this dude has lived for 60 years mm-hmm. and he has a wife. Like he has, he has this, and he has his, his son and he has, a, he has this relationship. And it's so interesting to me. Like that it's... duality of, of, a, of how you create this, like, as you always know, the, the Werther's original voice this yes, very was this original talking voice. <laughs> character that seems just like a friendly uncle grandpa to you. And then he's just like actually just a monster of an evil character. I actually really enjoy when people go this direction with their villains, with their especially monstrous villains. Mm-hmm. Because this is reality. Mm-hmm. Like, this is the truth. Like, you're going to find people who are absolute IRL horrific monsters but they're real good to their kid. Yeah. You know, and I Mm -hmm. I think there's a part of human nature and we really want to believe that monsters are monsters are monsters. They can't love or be loved. And so when they go home, they go home to like a tiny room where they sit and scheme or something. And it's like, no, there's, there is a lot more to it. And when you say, look, he's got a wife and kid, that's not you going. So understand that he's actually secretly good. It's like, no, understand that, monsters are capable of this yeah. and you can't and you can't let that stop you. <laughs> right. And not only I think it's a bit, it, it actually is in such stark contrast to the other characters. Like Lust was the only one who kind of know human decorum, but like Envy cannot be a human. Gluttony cannot nope. be a human. And I think it just is 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 just kind of fascinating to see like okay, but this one has to be a human and has to be existing in the real mm-hmm. world. And can't just be an evil bastard off in the shadows. I also find it interesting that, like, one of the most horrible people in the show has a happy family. Yeah. And all our heroes are largely from, you know, broken families. It's true. I mean, with Grant, it, it for varying degrees of broken. I mean, I consider yeah. Izumi, and her, Izumi and her husband, despite what happened to their baby, to be a complete family. Because they are, you know, very loving couple. And, yeah, sure. But, but you know, you know what I'm saying yeah. is like he's he's got the very, you know, one more daughter and he would have the perfect nuclear family. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> that perfect family thing going on. Um, uh huh. But no. Nah. <laughs> yeah. Now he, I keep remembering because you know we talk about the the weird unexpected similarities between our shows mm-hmm. that Ray Carling and King Bradley sort of both came out of the background <laughs> on the same on the on the same night of watching yeah yeah and you know he really was this sort of distant figure where his main purpose was that Mustang was totally going to take over from him someday mhm like it, he he was in sort of the you know if if Roy Mustang is I'm gonna be the Hokage <laughs> King Bradley is the Hokage you know it's and it's like <laughs> but then you sort of see him with Brown it's like oh shoot yeah and yeah. I love seeing the puzzle pieces sort of slide into place as you have all these different oh actually this was part of this and this was part of this yeah and and, and envy started the war yeah. and <laughs> envy that bastard. Oh my goodness. Yeah, and I think actually that really plays into, I think, why I wanted to kind of put a pin in the Ishval war thing was, yeah. you know, when I, again, in that flashback when Scar says, why are they attacking us? We're citizens. And, well, yeah. it's because it wasn't them who were attacking you. Envy started it, and as we know, King Bradley was in charge of the military, and yep. as he said, we've always been in charge of this country. So, they could do whatever the hell they wanted to, 
They just mm-hmm. needed to have an instigator to create an excuse, and Envy with the shape shifting could be that excuse. Yep. And I think that's really interesting. It obviously doesn't do any good for the people who died or anything, but yeah. I think it's interesting just because it adds another layer of complexity to the, the conflict and what happened and what that means going forward and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, this idea that there really initially there was no conflict. Yeah. There was there was no there was no problem. Someone just made one. Yeah. Mhm. And just But why? Yep, basically. But yeah, I remember, you know, earlier on when people are like, you know, why is this even happening? Mm-hmm. And you know, why did this even happen? And it's like, well, that's a really good question. There is no there is no really good reason. <laughs> and also as as cuz Ed Envy reveals this and Ed is righteously pissed off, but not just because he's not just because of the of the Ishmael thing, but obviously this always has a domino effect and as he's saying, mm-hmm. he doesn't just say like for instance this caused Winry's parents to die. He says you ruined my hometown because yep. remember Risenbull the town is geographically closer to Ishval than other places are and so there is an implication that then his hometown also was majorly affected by the war yeah. and not just yeah. the soldiers who went off to go fire or like the, the Rockbell parents going to go off to be doctors there and so this has a huge ripple effect on you know the world and the characters and all this shit and you know the sad thing is for me is saying there's still more to come there's still more to find out uh, <laughs> but i think it's the, i remember this episode with um the puzzle pieces in the stomach and we're seeing how the things are coming together i'm like okay now we're seeing more and more of the plot slide into place here and mm-hmm. a lot of just the oh oh shit oh <laughs> yeah it's it's funny. It's like, you know, we started out with like one to two plots and then other disconnected plots came in and now they're not disconnected and everything was always part of everything. Mm-hmm. And I know, I know that we haven't seen the end of it because looking around, seeing how this show is written so far and seeing how tightly everything is planned and that there's no extra pieces. Yeah. You know, and again, not all shown in series. Not all Shonen series are like this, but many are, Mm -hmm. where it's just character, 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 good luck keeping up with all these sons of bitches. Right. You know, but... Well, think about, like, I mean, for example, I watched Naruto for a while, and I remember just being like, it'd be like, all right, they're off to the land of waves, and then we never saw them again, and now we're off to the land of sand, and we never saw them ever again. And, you know, so it's like, a lot of characters in Shonen animes are basically disposable, they're there for the arc, Uh and then that's it. They've served their purpose. But as you see with FMA, number one, it's shorter. It's a planned out series. But number yep. two is, there's just not really the that structure of and now we're going to this place, and now we're, you know, now we're going to place that's blue and place that's red and place that's yellow. <laughs> and because, as you've seen, there's been a lot of backtracking in this show already. They've yeah. gone to and from places. They've gone back and forth to Risen Bowl. They've been to Rush Valley twice. Like, mm-hmm. they've been all over the place several times already. So there is no, like, sectorizing and casting off of characters. I actually forgot to mention that Dr. Marco was back in, yeah. the, in the previous episode. The homunculi, they have indeed kidnapped Dr. Marco. They're keeping him basically hostage, <sighs> essentially. Yeah. And he's contemplating killing himself. And they're just like, if you just tell us, we will save your town, but you'll do the whole country. Or you're gonna, oh, you're gonna right. do, you know, or you're gonna you're gonna save the country but doom your hometown. Like they have, they, they yeah, they're basically holding him hostage at this point. But like even Doctor Marco got brought back, and I say mm-hmm. even him just because I want to point out that FMA does what a lot of other a lot of other anime period doesn't do. It doesn't have these conventionally attractive characters. Yeah, it has characters who look like all kinds of people and all shapes and sizes, and so. And of all ages. And so Dr. Marco, you're like, ah, old man, not gonna count. Oh, he counts. Mm-hmm. Like, everyone counts. But, you know, like, just because you're like, oh, he's an old man, shit, shown an anime. No, he does matter, as does a lot of other characters who you might initially in any other series cast off. Also, just even characters who seemed very background to me, then all of a sudden in these episodes, it's like, you know, the, these uh, people who aren't as named and they work with Mustang it's like okay mm-hmm. well I'm gonna take I'm gonna take them away it's like oh you thought they were nothing well now they're pawns yeah exactly <laughs> yeah it's um Mustang's military gang I-, I think they're slightly more built up in the O3 series if just because there's a lot more room for filler in that series and so there's a, there's a kind of more like office shenanigans in the O3 uh, anime and so there's a bit more characters there's 
Let me just put this way. You spend more time with them in that series than necessarily that you do here. So like, I can understand how you, if you're just watching Brotherhood, you maybe aren't super connected to them necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like they're, they're, cause we, we know like, okay, well, Hawkeye is important, but we also are learning this episode. Oh no, it's not just Hawkeye. That's a vulnerable piece for Mustang. It is all these characters. It is all of his mm-hmm. gang. And background characters, especially like Dr. Knox, who was the coroner and also was the guy with the getaway car in the pre- episode. You're like, oh, he's back. Like, oh yeah, these dudes, like, you're like, oh, psh, you know, again, random side background character. I will say if they have a name, there is a 99% chance they're going to come back. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> that's how it works. It is very impressive. I was hit really hard by the very end of this pair of episodes oh yeah with with al at the door oh gosh i forgot that you haven't seen that at all it's it was like so we've talked about working with crunchyroll i see stuff Mm -hmm. you know i know and there was this one image of ed that i would see Mm -hmm. as like a a promotional image is a very dramatic image and i would occasionally use it when i wanted to have a really striking is it the one of him like pointing through the door yes okay yeah and now because that was actually used i think it was used on some like special edition dvd covers i think it it is kind of like a known image yeah and i had no idea what it It just looked (laughs) sick you (laughs) know and i was like and it was funny because Here's this image that I have seen casually Mm -hmm. for literal years just as a side effect of my work. And suddenly, bam, there it is. I'm like, oh, my God, is that what this is? Oh, my gosh. I didn't even even think about that. I I just have seen Alphonse so much. I've seen this this a lot and I've read the manga where it's like that image is already in my head. Like, I just know it. And I forgot that this, I think this is the first time in this series that you see it. Obviously, because Ed is, like, shocked to see him there. Yeah, yeah. But it was just this weird ripple effect retcon through my memory. Where <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> ev- every time it's like, I see this scene, I'm like, oh my god, and the emotion hits me. And then any time I have ever just scrubbed through that image before... <laughs> Look, looking for a dramatic FMA picture for a news story. Bam, bam, bam. Now it's just retroactively in there as what it is. And I'm like, oh my god. This, this is the weird thing about writing for an anime site. You can't have seen every anime. Right. And mm-hmm. I know that FMA is a big one. and it's, That's one reason I wanted to see it. Mm-hmm. But every day, you're going to be writing for shows you haven't seen, shows you've partially seen, shows yeah. that no longer exist on tape, shows that haven't come out yet. The thing is, like, there's a lot of anime. There's a ton of anime. There is no way you can humanly keep up with everything. So I'm very used to not knowing everything yeah. and just get, you know, going to someone who knows and being like, Hey, is there anything I should say? Is there anything I shouldn't say? Are there any horrific puns? Like whenever I write about Madoka, I have to say something about mommy not losing her head. AKA, hey. AKA I'm, the, I'm the Digimon resource. <laughs> yes, you are the Digimon resource. I've uh, d- Listeners, I did, in fact, on Crunchyroll, there was a first ever best Digimon poll and... The website was comp- uh, it was machine translated, and so I went to Ginger, like, can you please just double check these? I do not want to get this wrong. Because yeah. <laughs> I haven't se- I I know a couple of Digimon. But, like, yeah, so I'm used to becoming familiar with aspects of shows without having seen them, mm-hmm. and then getting the whiplash of seeing what was important. Yeah, no, that makes sense. <laughs> um but and it's, I, and it's fun I, yeah. and it's fun is the thing yeah and yeah it's um i just forgot and i'm like oh yeah i guess it, it is extremely impactful because i mean there's two things one is that we haven't seen alphonse in his human body except for when he's like a little baby so they're, they're, yeah when i say that i mean like an eight-year-old but you know like we just haven't seen yes. him physically and then number two it's like not only that but he's ex- he's very sickly and very thin because what we can d- d- do is, is that he's kind of just being kept alive in this area in, in this in the truth portal but also yeah. i think it's interesting is that it does verify ed's theory that their souls are intertwined because they're blood mixed when they were doing the human transportation another mm-hmm. small detail that i wanted to point out that i actually didn't notice until recently the doors that ed and al have are actually different Ed mm. and Al don't have the same alchemy door. They're both, like, alchemy things, I believe. I was just reading a wiki page about this, where Ed's is something else, and, and Alphonse's is something else, and they're related to um, 
you know, like traditional imagery. I think Alphonse has something to do with like a tree image in Jewish. Um, yeah, 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 lore, yeah. You know, like the like a Jewish lore kind of a thing. But they're both a, they're both like a thing that you could translate to alchemy studies. So what sure. what I like about that is like it, it's a really good detail. And if we ever see like a Zoomies again, then I I would like to see what hers looks like just to kind of compare them. But oh yeah. But what I think is interesting about it is it's just another flavor for the show where it does show that alchemy is like art where everyone is going to be different. And so you approach it differently than anybody else will. And I like it because even though Ed and Al studied alchemy together and did all that stuff together, they are different people and have different philosophies about alchemy. And I just thought that was a cool character, kind of a little flavor thing going on there to kind of show everyone's philosophy about the subject. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, it's, again, there is just so much dang detail and the detail changes. Mm -hmm. And it really is, everything really is so personal. I kind of love that. Yeah. Because it makes you think, because I totally, I was 15 when this show was out at one point. I totally created a, a full Metal Alchemist OC. It's... That's so cool. I mean, that, we rag on OCs, but they're fun. Mm-hmm. And if, here's the thing. If you can, and I say this as a writer and I say this as a fan, if you can effectively create an OC within a world, like if you could really detailed do it, that's a sign of good world building. Yeah, that's true. Like, if if someone can come along and from top to bottom say, you know, here is the type of character this would be, here is how they would function in this world, here are the specifics, then you really have given someone enough to work from. Mm -hmm. And that's impressive. I'll just say the TLDR is that hilariously my character ended up being what the one-off Isaac McDougall was in the first episode of Brotherhood, who was an anime-only creation. (laughs) Oh, bless. It was like a water alchemist-based thing, and it was just totally Isaac McDougall, but I created mine first, (laughs) so my OC, don't steal. I will be suing Square Enix now for stealing my FMA OC idea. (laughs) I mean, Square... Considering Square Enix uh, knocked itself for copyright infringement on YouTube you know, <laughs> during that whole thing, I, you know, you got I think you got a good chance there. You got good odds. Mm. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I love that. I love that scene. I love the two doors. I love the. Oh my god. No, oh, Alphonse, it's gonna be okay, Alphonse. We're gonna get you. Oh, and I do. I'm again. I always talk about you know Shao. I love my little favorite panda. Uh, <laughs> I like I like that Shao and Al are getting along now. Yes, <laughs> probably out of necessity because Shao knows that uh, Al is the absolute top of the food chain in the world, and as as we saw in the previous episode, and <laughs> so it 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 is best to befriend the top of the food chain. This is true. But yes. do you want to do a, a brief visit to Shipping Corner? Let's go to the Shipping Corner. Da 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 da. Um, <laughs> Annie and Sam were very sweet at the end of the episode. It was like oh the gosh. one time, it was finally the one time that Sam was not being stupidly weird Sam Future Man. Because yeah, he was just he was... so sweet at the end of the episode. I think everyone, I think they were both just so relieved that he wasn't losing his entire shit. Yeah. And she was like, do you feel all right? No weird voices. And he wanted to be like, well, you know, no more than the usual. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is just ba- base level weird voices, not the extra ones. <laughs> but it w- it was this very just sweet, calm moment, and there was this this time when like they're just on a level now. Yeah, like at, at least within that time where it's just it's two coworkers, and again, it's it's all the little tropes waiting by him while he's sick, and uh, I'll sh- the. The one thing missing was, like, coming in and putting a blanket over him. Like, that is that was, true. Yeah, that's the one thing we didn't get. If she had come in and put the blanket over it would have been Trope City and it would have been adorable, but... And in fairness, though, they were at the office, so it's yeah. not exactly blankets lying around freely. Nah, that's true. But it was very sweet, and it was, you know, even when, she, when he asked her out and she's like, I'll think about it, it's with this little sweet, sort of flirty, and you know they both understand that mm-hmm. it's... You know, it's it's not a difficulty. It's a you want to go out, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> they they are in no you hang up territory now, <laughs> which, is, <laughs> which is good. It's it's great. Yeah. Yes. And then when it comes to FMA, it's oh. I think I think obviously it's just it's the Hawkeye must and Mustang thing all over again. I'm upset. I'm upset that like 
What is it I was saying to you? You know the ship is real when the bad guys know it's real? Yes, that was it. Yeah. Like, when, when the bad guy's like, I know exactly where to hit you, and it's like, oh, yeah, it's canon, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and I, and I, I, I said this in my recap, but I think what's interesting is, yes, he is, he is, Bradley is disbanding Mustang's whole gang. However, the way it's, the way it was framed and cut. So, number one, it's morning time now. Mustang and Bradley are talking in the morning. H- Hawkeye is still outside at the car, waiting. <laughs> She so poor girl was, has so. been there for probably like 10 hours now, waiting. But like the way the shot is, the way the scene is framed, it kind of like shows Hawkeye and then it goes back inside and, you know, Bradley is like, I know your weakness, you know, I don't have a weakness, but you have a weakness and I know what it is. So yeah, we, uh, yep, we're getting that sweet Hawkeye Mustang action. <laughs> Yay! And when we say sweet Hawkeye Mustang action, we mean separating them. We mean separating them. Well, <laughs> inter- interestingly enough, though, is that they're both still in Central. Everybody else is being physically moved out of the city to across the country, but they're both so still she, in Central. She is going to be painfully within reach. Painfully within reach, but now under, uh, under the thumb of the, the super duper bad guy slash uh, king of the country. Uh, Whoops. Uh, uh, it hurts. Oof. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. All right. Let's oh, leave Shipping a... Corner now. Doop 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 doop. Now I talk about sin and violence. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, biggest sin, biggest violence. Okay. My favorite violence was a note that I have written down, which just says uh, Jean does a lot of kicking, and I think that's my favorite thing. Was I just love every? I love dumb. I I think I have to give it. I know this is so so cheating. The very beginning with claymation. Gene, like, beating up a guy with a trash can lid. I, I, yeah, kind of. Um, um, otherwise it has to go to Gene beating up a teenager, and I don't know how I feel about that. So, I, I would, honestly, I would say the drop kick off the fence. The drop kick, off, yeah, that's pretty good. The fact that that, that re- remained in both Gene and Annie's version means that it really happened. <laughs> Also, I just want to point out, it's really interesting, and I didn't notice this until this watch, that Gene dressed a lot better literally one year ago. Yes. <laughs> like, he was in he was in the full three-piece suit, handkerchief in the jacket pocket, and I'm like, is, is, is this the case that fucked him up? <laughs> <laughs> like, is, is it after this case that he went, I just feel really depressed because I had to tell people that they're little girl died and i just don't give a shit anymore mm-hmm. i don't know or i mean it could costume wise it is probably just a way to delineate even harder between you know flashback and present but it's a thing i noticed it's a because thing. it's a decision because that, it's i like decision suits that was made because i like suits i like three-piece suits so i noticed yeah no, but I mean, I think it's I think it's always fair to point out those things because as a character, as a I mean, I'm an art person. I pretend right. to be, but when you're drawing no, a you char- when you're drawing a character and you're outfitting them, you have to always just be you have to be thinking unless you're drawing a sort of like thematic piece for its own reason. If you're drawing a character and it's in their clothing, you know, it has to be like, does this clothing fit the character? Right. And I have drawn characters from different, you know, being different ages, and they're always wearing different clothes depending on their age. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's just like, okay, so, like, you know, when the character is 30, they're wearing this, but when they were 15, they were wearing this. And not right. only does it, it, again, it does tell an age difference, but it does be like, um, you know, at one point in time, they felt they felt the need to dress this way. So I think it's inter- I do think it's valid to point out, okay, at one point in time, Gene Hunt felt like he should dress the way he does, and then he didn't. And, I mean, we are like yeah. that as people, you know? I know that even right. year by year, my, my word, I, my, my general word doesn't change, but stylistically I will change little things about it. And so I could be like, oh yeah, in 2016, I wore a lot of hoodies. In 2017, uh-huh. I also wore a lot of hoodies. But, you know, <laughs> but, you know, just be like, this was different. And I, you know, I, oh, I, I learned, I, I wore more V-necks this year, that kind of a thing, you know? Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's an interesting thing to point out. Yeah, it is. But, yeah, I think I would put technically best violence within the show as being the drop kick, but in our hearts, best violence is Camberwick Green, Gene, uh, kicking in a nonce and beating him with a trash can lid. Oh, God, that was so funny. <laughs> that was so good. I just want to watch that scene again after this, just because the, the, the kick, 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 little wave. Yes, <laughs> that, was, that was the best part. It's like, oh, here's Gene Hunt. Kick, kick, kick. And then he's just waving. 
God. Oh my God. It was so funny. Uh, and so I typically the... find claymation unsettling and creepy. This so, was so I like seeing it very cute and charming and pure. And yes, Jean beating a guy up, it was pure because it's in claymation form. So you know what? Everything is innocent when it's in claymation. And it's, this is, like I said, this is very popular. This is, this bit, and I mean, again, it's going back to a known children's show that people grew up with. Mm -hmm. It is so genuinely popular that Camberwick Green version Gene and Sam (laughs) have fan art of, like, people have made their own versions of the puppets, and it's just, you know, for little displays, and... If you have that kind of tie to the show in your childhood, see, like, that show as a kid and this show as an adult, it totally makes sense. Mm. Like, oh, it's two of my favorite things. And, right. and they're canonically together, so I'm going right. to celebrate that. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's our violent sin. Um, My favorite sin, I think, <laughs> I think is learning that Envy was the one that started the Ishval War. I think it's because yeah, that's... that, to me, just, again, it, just, it, it makes that conflict... It makes it make a lot more sense, and it also just makes it that much more horrific. I, I think I'm with you on that, mm. because when it's just like, oh, hey, you know this thing that's torn, like, thousands of millions of lives apart? It was me all along! <laughs> <laughs> and I already like, hate you. <laughs> it's like, look, we already hate you deeply, but thanks for piling on. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, when you meet your friend's friend... And there's just something off-putting about them, but you don't have a real reason to dislike them, so you just have to grumble to yourself, and then you find out they did something really shitty, and then you're just, I knew! I, I knew, knew this! <laughs> That's finding out Envy started the war, is, I didn't like you to begin with, but now I have, like, 50 reasons! Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's that's the sin, and that's the violence. Oh. Well, look at that. I guess we'll call that a wrap, then. I think so. That was the Sin and Violence podcast. I'm Ginger. And I'm Kara. And that was Sin and Violence. The podcast of equivalent exchange.